This is a LibriVox recording of what is thought to be the earliest recorded poem written in the English language. It was written sometime in the seventh century. I'm reading the version written in the early West Saxon dialect. Cadman's Hymn Nu Shulan Herian, Heofun Riches Werd, Meltedus Mechte, and his Mod Yethank, Werk Wulder Fader, Swahe Wunder Gewes, E Chedrichten, or Unstelde. He erst shop er von Bernum, he von Tohrofa, Halig shippend, Tha midanjerd, monkenes werd, E Chedrichten, after Theoda, Firum foldan, Freya elmichtig. End of poem. Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 10th, 2006, in Oceanside, California. If you'd like to read along with the text, you can visit kray.org slash cadman.html. That's c-a-e-d-m-o-n dot html. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. THE CHILDREN'S HOUR by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Recorded for LibriVox.org by Robert Garrison Between the dark and the daylight, when the night is beginning to lower, comes a pause in the day's occupations that is known as the children's hour. I hear in the chamber above me the patter of little feet, the sound of a door that is opened, and voices soft and sweet. From my study I see in the lamplight, descending the broad hall stair, grave Alice and laughing Allegra, and Edith with golden hair. A whisper and then a silence, yet I know by their merry eyes, they are plotting and planning together to take me by surprise. A sudden rush from the stairway, a sudden raid from the hall. By three doors left unguarded, they enter my castle wall. They climb up into my turret, or the arms and back of my chair. If I try to escape, they surround me. They seem to be everywhere. They almost devour me with kisses. Their arms about me entwine, till I think of the Bishop of Bingen in his mouse tower on the Rhine. Do you think, O oh blue-eyed banditti, because you have scaled the wall, such an old mustache as I am is not a match for you all? I have you fast in my fortress, and will not let you depart, but put you down into the dungeon, in the round tower of my heart, and there will I keep you forever, yes, forever and a day, till the walls shall crumble to ruin, and molder in dust away. End of poem. The Daffodils by William Wordsworth, read for LibriVox.org by Mary Anderson. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when I on my couch I lie, In vacant or in pensive mood, They flash upon that inward eye Which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills, And dances with the daffodils. End of poem. This reading is in the public domain. 
The Flowers Ball by Ben King, read for LibriVox.org by Mary Anderson. There is an olden story, tis a legend, so I'm told, how the flowerets gave a banquet in the ivy days of old, how the posies gave a party once, what that wound up with a ball, how they held it in a valley down in flowery kingdom hall. The flowers of every clime were there, of high and low degree, all with their petals polished in sweet aromatic glee. They met down in this woodland, in the soft and ambient air, each in its lolling loveliness exhaled a perfume rare. An orchestra of bluebells sat upon a mossy knoll, and pealed forth gentle music that quite captured every soul. The holly hawked a pistol just to buy a suit of clothes, and danced with all the flowerets but the modest blushing rose. The morning glory shining, seemed reflecting all the glow, of dawn and took a partner, it was young Miss Mistletoe. Miss Maggie Nolia from the south danced with Forget-Me-Not, Sweet William took Miss Pink in tow and danced a slow gavotte. Thus everything went swimmingly amongst perfumed bells and bows, and every flower it reveled save the modest blushing rose. Miss Fuchsia sat around and told, for floral emulation, that she had actually refused to dance with a carnation. The coxcomb, quite a dandy there, began to pine and mope, until he had been introduced to young Miss Heliotrope. Sir Cactus took Miss Lily, and he swung her so about, she asked Sweet Pea to call a flower and put the cactus out. Miss Pansy took her poppy, and she waltzed him down the line, till they ran against Old Sunflower with Miss Honeysuckle Vine. The others at the party that went whirling through the mazy were the Misses Rhododendron, Daffodil, and Little Daisy. Miss Petunia, Miss Verbena, Violet, and sweet Miss Dahlia came fashionably late arrayed in very rich regalia. Miss Begonia, sweet Miss Buttercup, Miss Lilac, and Miss Clover, young Dandelion came in late when all the feast was over. The only flower that sent regrets and really couldn't come, who lived in the four hundred, was the vain Chrysanthemum. One floweret at the table grew quite ill, we must regret, and every posy wondered, too, just what Miss Mignonette. Young Tulip chose Miss Orchid from the first and did not part, with her until Miss Marigold fell with a bleeding heart. But ah, Miss Rose sat pensively till every young bud passed her, when just to fill the last quadrille the little china asked her. End of poem The Gods of the Copybook Headings by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by Andy Minter The God of the Copybook Headings by Rudyard Kipling As I pass through my incarnations in every age and race, I make my proper prostrations to the gods of the marketplace. Peering through reverent fingers, I watch them flourish and fall, and the gods of the copybook headings I notice outlast them all. We were living in trees when they met us; they showed us each in turn that water would certainly wet us, as fire would certainly burn. But we found them lacking in uplift, vision, and breadth of mind, so we left them to teach the gorillas. While we followed the march of mankind, we moved as the spirit listed. They never altered their pace, being neither cloud nor windborne, like the gods of the marketplace. But they always caught up with our progress, and presently word would come that a tribe had been wiped off its ice fields, or the lights had gone out in Rome. With the hopes that our world is built on, they were utterly out of touch. They denied that the moon was Stilton. They denied that she was even Dutch. They denied that wishes were horses. They denied that a pig had wings. So we worship the gods of the market, who promised these beautiful things. When the Cambrian measures were forming, they promised perpetual peace. They swore, if we gave them our weapons, that the wars of the tribes would cease. 
but when we disarmed they sold us, and delivered us bound to our foe. And the gods of the copy-book headings said, Stick to the devil you know. On the first Ferminian sandstones we were promised the fuller life, which started by loving our neighbour, and ended by loving his wife, till our women had no more children, and the men lost reason and faith, and the gods of the copy-book headings said the wages of sin is death. In the Carboniferous Epoch we were promised abundance for all by robbing selected Peter to pay for collective Paul. But though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy, and the gods of the copy-book headings said if you don't work you die. Then the gods of the market tumbled, and their smooth-tongued wizards withdrew, and the hearts of the meanest were humbled, and began to believe it was true that all is not gold that glitters, and two and two make four, and the gods of the copy-book headings limped up to explain it once more. As it will be in the future, it was at the birth of man, there are only four things certain, since social progress began, that the dog returns to his vomit, and the sow returns to her mire, and the burnt fool's bandaged finger goes wobbling back to the fire. And that after this is accomplished, and the brave new world begins, when all men are paid for existing, and no man must pay for his sins, as surely as water will wet us, as surely as fire will burn, the gods of the copy-book headings, with terror and slaughter return. End of poem The Latest Decalogue by Arthur Hugh Clough Read for LibriVox by Andy Minter. Thou shalt have one God only, who would be at the expense of two. No graven images may be worshipped except the currency. Swear not at all, for for thy curse, thine enemy is none the worse. At church on Sunday to attend, will serve to keep the world thy friend. Honour thy parents, that is, all, from whom advancement may befall. Thou shalt not kill, but needst not strive officiously to keep alive. Do not adultery commit, advantage rarely comes of it. Thou shalt not steal an empty feet, when it's so lucrative to cheat. Bear not false witness, let the lie have time on its own wings to fly. Thou shalt not covet, but tradition approves all forms of competition. The sum of all is thou shalt love, if anybody, God above, at any rate, shall never labour more than thyself to love thy neighbour. End of poem. The Legatee by Ambrose Bierce Read for LibriVox.org by Elizabeth Gellner In fair San Francisco a good man did dwell, And he wrote out a will, for he didn't feel well. Said he, it is proper when making a gift To stimulate virtue by comforting thrift. So he left all his property, legal and straight, To the cursedest rascal in all of the state, but the name he refused to insert, for, said he, let each man consider himself legatee. In due course of time that philanthropist died, and all San Francisco and Oakland beside, save only the lawyers, came each with his claim, the lawyers preferring to manage the same. The cases were tried in Department 13, Judge Murphy presided, sedate and serene, but couldn't quite specify legal and straight the cursedest rascal in all of the state. And so he remarked to them, little and big, to claimants, you skip, and to lawyers, you dig. 
they tumbled tumultuous out of his court, and left him victorious, holding the fort. "'Twas then that he said, It is plain to my mind, This property's ownerless. How can I find the cursedest rascal in all of the state? So he took it himself, which was legal and straight. End of poem. Let It Be Forgotten by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Sindigachov Let it be forgotten as a flower is forgotten, Forgotten as a fire that once was singing gold. Let it be forgotten for ever and ever. Time is a kind friend, he will make us old. If anyone asks, say it was forgotten long and long ago, As a flower, as a fire, as a hushed footfall in a long forgotten snow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Microbe by Hilaire Belloc. Read for LibriVox.org by Larissa Migachev. The microbe is so very small you cannot make him out at all, but many sanguine people hope to see him through a microscope. His jointed tongue that lies beneath a hundred curious rows of teeth, his seven tufted tails with lots of lovely pink and purple spots, on each of which a pattern stands composed of forty separate bands, his eyebrows of a tender green. All these have never yet been seen, but scientists who ought to know assure us that they must be so. Oh, let us never, never doubt what nobody is sure about. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Out, Out by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox by Alex Foster The buzzsaw snarled and rattled in the yard, and made dust, and dropped stove-length sticks of wood, sweet-scented stuff when the breeze drew across it. And from there those that lifted eyes could count five mounted ranges, one behind the other, under the sunset far into Vermont. And the saw snarled and rattled, snarled and rattled, as it ran light or had a bear to load. And nothing happened. Day was all but done. Call it a day, I wish they might have said, to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. His sister stood beside them in her apron to tell them supper. At the word, the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, leapt out at the boy's hand, or seemed to leap, he must have given the hand. However it was, neither refused the meeting, but the hand. The boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh as he swung toward them holding up the hand, half in appeal, but half as if to keep the life from spilling. Then the boy saw all. Since he was old enough to know, big boy doing a man's work, though a child at heart, he saw all spoiled. Don't let him cut my hand off, the doctor, when he comes. Don't let him, sister. So. But the hand was gone already. The doctor put him in the dark of ether. He lay and puffed his lips out with his breath, and then the watcher at his pulse took fright. No one believed. They listened at his heart. Little. Less. Nothing. And that ended it. No more to build on there. And they, since they were not the one dead, turned to their affairs. End of poem. Read for LibriVox.org by Alex Foster. Me. UK. Eighth of April, twenty o six. Selections from Rigveda Americanus. Sacred Songs of the Ancient Mexicans Edited by Daniel G. Brinton Read for LibriVox.org by Laura Fox of ShiningHalf.com For untranslated text and notes, please see the e-text at Project Gutenberg, Gutenberg.org Number 6. Hymn to Ixcosauqui, the God of Fire in the hall of flames, let me not put to shame my ancestors. Descending there, let me not put you to shame. I fasten a rope to the sacred tree. I twist it in eight folds, that by it I, a magician, may descend to the magical house. Begin your song in the hall of flames. 
begin your song in the hall of flames. Why does the magician not come forth? Why does he not rise up? Let his subjects assist in the hall of flames. He appears, he appears. Let his subjects assist. Let the servants never cease the song in the hall of flames. Let them rejoice greatly. Let them dance wonderfully. Call ye for the woman with abundant hair, whose care is the mist and the rain. Call ye for her. Number 12. Hymn to Iopechcatl, the goddess of childbirth. Truly, in whatever house there is a lying in, Iopechcatl takes charge of the child. Truly, in whatever house there is a lying in, Iopechcatl takes charge of the child, there where it is weeping in the house. Come along and cry out, cry out, cry out, you newcomer, come along and cry out. Come along and cry out, cry out, cry out, you little jewel, cry out. Number 14. Hymn sung at a fast every eight years. The flower in my heart blossoms and spreads abroad in the middle of the night. Tonan has satisfied her passion. The goddess Tlazolteotl has satisfied her passion. I, Sinteotl, was born in paradise. I come from the place of flowers. I am the only flower, the new, the glorious one. Sinteotl was born from the water. He came born as a mortal, as a youth from the cerulean home of the fishes, a new, a glorious god. He shone forth as the sun. His mother dwelt in the house of the dawn, varied in hue as the quechol bird. A new, a glorious flower. I came forth on the earth, Even to the market-place like a mortal, Even I, Quetzalcoatl, great and glorious. Be ye happy under the flower-bush, Varied in hue as the Quetzal-bird. Listen to the Quetzal singing to the gods, Listen to the singing of the Quetzal along the river, Hear its flute along the river, In the house of the reeds. Alas, would that my flowers would cease from dying. Our flesh is as flowers, even as flowers in the place of flowers. He plays at ball, he plays at ball, the servant of marvelous skill. He plays at ball, the precious servant, look at him. Even the ruler of the nobles follows him to his house. O youths, O youths, follow the example of your ancestors. Make yourselves equal to them in the ball count. Establish yourselves in your houses. She goes to the mart. They carry Zochiquetzal to the mart. She speaks at Cholula. She startles my heart. She startles my heart. She has not finished. The priest knows her. Where the merchants sell green jade earrings, she is to be seen. In the place of wonders, she is to be seen. Sleep, sleep, sleep. I fold my hands to sleep. I, O oh woman, sleep. End of Selections Recorded April 4, 2006. This recording is in the public domain. The Rosebud to the Lady Jane Wharton by William Broom Read for LibriVox.org by Mary Anderson Queen of fragrance, lovely rose, the beauties of thy leaves disclose. The winter's past, the tempests fly, soft gales breathe gently through the sky. The lark, sweet warbling on the wing, salutes the gay return of spring. The silver dews, the vernal showers, call forth a bloomy waste of flowers. The joyous fields, the shady woods, are clothed with green or swell with buds. Then haste thy beauties to disclose, queen of fragrance, lovely rose. Thou beauteous flower, a welcome guest, shall flourish on the fairest one's breast. Shalt grace her hand or deck her hair, the flowers most sweet, the nymph most fair. Breathe soft, ye winds, be calm, ye skies, arise, ye flowery race, arise, and haste thy beauties to disclose, queen of fragrance, lovely rose. But thou, fair nymph, thyself survey in this sweet offspring of a day, that miracle of face must fail, 
Thy charms are sweet, but charms are frail. Swift as the short-lived flower they fly, At morn they bloom, at evening die. Though sickness yet a while forbears, Yet time destroys what sickness spares. Now Helen lives alone in fame, And Cleopatra's but a name. Time must indent that heavenly brow, And thou must be what Helen's now. This moral to the fair disclose, Queen of fragrance, lovely rose. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. Sonnet by Rupert Brooke A recording for LibriVox by Alex Foster I said I splendidly loved you. It isn't true. Such long swift tides stir not a landlocked sea. On gods or fools the high risk falls on you, the clean, clear, bitter sweet that's not for me. Love soars from earth to ecstasies unwist. Love is flung Lucifer-like from heaven to hell. But there are wanderers in the middle mist who cry for shadows, clutch, and cannot tell whether they love at all or loving whom, an old song's lady, a fool in fancy dress, or phantoms, or their own face in the gloom, for love of love, or from heart's loneliness. Pleasures not theirs, nor pain, they doubt, and sigh, and do not love at all. Of these am I. End of poem. Read for LibriVox.org by AlexFoster.me.uk Nottingham, England, 8th of April, 2006 so oft as I her beauty do behold by Edmund Spencer Read for LibriVox dot org by Annie Coleman So oft as I her beauty do behold and therewith do her cruelty compare I marvel of what substance was the mould the which her made at once so cruel fair not earth, for her high thoughts more heavenly are. Not water, for her love doth burn like fire. Not air, for she is not so light or rare. Not fire, for she doth freeze with faint desire. Then needs another element inquire, Whereof she mote be made. That is, the sky. For to the heaven her haughty looks aspire, And eke her mind is pure immortal high. Then, sith to heaven ye likened are the best, Be like in mercy as in all the rest. End of poem. Stay, O oh Sweet, by John Donne, read for LibriVox.org, by Annie Coleman. Stay, O oh Sweet, and do not rise, the light that shines comes from thine eyes. The day breaks not, it is my heart, because that you and I must part. Stay, or else my joys will die and perish in their infancy. Tis true, tis day, what thought it be? Oh, wilt thou therefore rise from me? Why should we rise, because tis light? Did we lie down, because t'was night? Love, which in spite of darkness brought us hither, Should, in despite of light, keep us together. Light hath no tongue, but is all I. If it could speak as well as spy, This were the worst that it could say, That, being well, I fain would stay, And that I loved my heart and honour so, And that I would not from him that had them go. Must business thee from hence remove? Oh, that's the worst disease of love. The poor, the fool, the false, Love can admit, but not the busied man. He which hath business, and makes love, Doth do such wrong, 
as when a married man doth woo. End of poem. The Sugar Plum Tree by Eugene Field. Read for LibriVox.org by Mary Anderson. Have you ever heard of the Sugar Plum Tree? Tis a marvel of great renown. It blooms on the shore of the Lollipop Sea in the garden of Shut Eye Town. The fruit that it bears is so wondrously sweet, as those who have tasted it say, that good little children have only to eat of that fruit to be happy next day. When you've got to the tree you would have a hard time to capture the fruit which I sing. The tree is so tall that no person can climb to the boughs where the sugar plums swing. But up in that tree sits a chocolate cat and a gingerbread dog prowls below. And this is the way you contrive to get at those sugar plums tempting you so. You say but the word to that gingerbread dog, and he barks with terrible zest, that the chocolate cat is at once all agog, as her swelling proportions attest. And the chocolate cat goes cavorting around from this leafy limb unto that, and the sugar plums tumble, of course, to the ground. Hooray for that chocolate cat! There are marshmallows, gumdrops, and peppermint canes, with stripings of scarlet and gold, and you carry away of the treasure that reigns as much as your apron can hold. So come, little child, cuddle closer to me in your dainty white nightcap and gown, and I'll rock you away to that sugar plum tree in that garden of Shut Eye Town. End of poem. This poem is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There Will Come Soft Rain by Sarah Teasdale There will come soft rain and the smell of the ground, and swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pools singing at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it is done. Not one will mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. End of poem. The Tongues of Toil by William Francis Bernard Read for LibriVox.org by Stephen Collins do you hear the call from a hundred lands, lords of a dying name? We are the men of sinewed hands whom the earth and the seas acclaim. We are the hordes that made you lords and gathered your gear and spoil, and we speak with a word that should be heard, hark to the tongues of toil. The power of your hands it falls at last, the strength of your rule is o'er, where the might of a million slaves is massed to shouts of a million more. We rise, we rise, neath the western skies, in the dawns of the east afar, and our myriads swarm in the southern lands warm, and under a northern star. We take no thought of the fears you feel, and the rage you hold at heart, nor of all your strength of gold and steel enthroned at the gates of Mart. We have no care for the deed you dare, for the force your armies hurled. You stand but few, and we challenge you, strong men of all the world. We served as your fools when time was young, and long, long we forbore, glad of the niggard boons you flung, the least of your ample store. But the gnawing pain of a starving brain is great as the belly need. We have learned at last from a hungry past the joys of a rebel deed. We come, we come, with a force of fate, we are not weak, but strong. We parley not, and we cannot wait, we march with a freeman's song. We claim for me what a life we can need that lives as a life should live, not less, not more, from the plenteous store from which freeborn labors give. We shall shape a world as a world should be, with room enough for all. We will rear a race of wise and free, and not of the great and small. And the heart and the mind of humankind shall drink to the dregs of good, forgetting the tears of a darker years and the curse of Bauman's blood. In vain you soften the voice of greed, in vain you speak us fair. The time is late, we hark, nor heed, in gladness still we dare. Yield, then yield, to the force we wield, to the masses of our might. We are countless strong, the throat of wrong, the warriors of the right. Yes, we are the captains of the earth and warders of the sea. 
of a race newborn in nobler birth, the mighty and the free. We clasp all hands to the farthest lands, we swear by our mother's soil, to take the meed who have done the deed, harp to the tongues of toil. End of poem. Vitae Lampada by Henry Newbolt Read for LibriVox by Alex Foster There's a breathless hush in the close tonight. Ten to make and the match to win, A bumping pitch and a blinding light, An hour to play and the last man in. And it's not for the sake of a ribboned coat Or the, the selfish hope of a season's fame, But his captain's hand on his shoulder smote. Play up, play up and play the game. The sand of the desert is sodden red, Red with the wreck of a square that broke, The gatlings jammed and the colonel dead, And the regiment blind with dust and smoke. The river of death has brimmed his banks And England's far, an honour and name. But the voice of a schoolboy rallies the ranks, Play up, play up and play the game. This is the word that, year by year, while in her place the school is set, every one of her sons must hear, and none that hears it dare forget. This they all with a joyful mind bear through life like a torch in flame, and falling, fling to the host behind, play up, play up and play the game. Read for LibriVox.org by AlexFoster.me.uk on the 8th of April, 2006. Winter Stars by Sarah Teasdale Read for LibriVox.org by Larissa Migachev I went out at night alone. The young blood flowing beyond the sea seemed to have drenched my spirit's wings. I bore my sorrow heavily. But when I lifted up my head from shadows shaken on the snow, I saw Orion in the east burn steadily as long ago. From windows in my father's house, dreaming my dreams on winter nights, I watched Orion as a girl above another city's lights. Years go, dreams go, and youth goes too. The world's heart breaks beneath its wars. All things are changed, save in the east the faithful beauty of the stars. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.